I'm also joined this morning by a panel of uh, six, I will call them six enthusiastic gardeners. And they are Glenn Hitchings, Sue Hosier, Chris Main, Sue Clark, Jan O'Connor, and Steve Cox. We're going to begin by each of the panelists, they own in turn to give us a brief insight into what they will be focusing on in, these, in this month of March as this gardening year opens. And certainly what an opening it's been this week with um, some chilly winds, but plenty of sunshine to wrap up warm and begin those jobs that urgently need doing. Thereafter, we'll be looking at um, those questions that you, some of you may already have submitted. They've all come in more or less anonymously. So we might ask having gone around the team to venture forth suggestions and helpful comments to say, has that helped you or not? And um, we will do our best to answer them. There, thereafter, if there's time, because we can only run this session for just about an hour, I think, um, we will open the up to questions from yourselves who are present this morning. And, um, and again, we'll do our best to answer those questions, having had no pre-knowledge um, of what's coming our way. So it'll be literally, here we go and see what's, uh, what we can come up with. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Glenn and each of the panelists follow, are going to follow each other and they're going to give a very brief um, pitch on what they're currently doing in the month of March. So over to you, Glenn, thank you. <clears throat> You'll need to unmute yourself, Glenn. Okay, right, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, good, okay. All right, well, I'm, I'm gonna talk about allotments, but not exclusively about allotments, more about uh, growing fruit and veg, um, which you can do obviously in, in, in your back gardens. And I would hope that probably most of you have got something like, I don't know, an apple tree or, or a strawberry patch or some, somewhere to grow things. In fact, our first house that we had, and Linda will laugh at this, we, we, we basically moved in after, shortly after we got married. And I dug up the whole of the garden apart from a square of lawn that she could lie on. <laughs> and she'd often come home and find me in the potting shed with a bit of string onto the pram where her first daughter was. And I would give it a rock every so often. So you can always do a lot in a back garden as well as an allotment. But so, yeah, I'm going to talk probably what I'm up to on the allotment at the moment. But obviously this is transferable to your, to your gardens as well, as I'm sure most of you know. So although the the weather has brightened up as Gordon said it's still quite cold in the mornings and the soil is quite cold so need to exercise a bit of a strain in planting out any seeds and things because there's a fair chance they may not survive if it turns cold and wet so but there's a lot you can do to be fair on a lot there's a lot that I'm doing at the moment uh, first of all finishing off any pruning uh, particularly of fruit um, fruit bushes, um, grapevines, that sort of thing. So if you've got a grapevine around a gazebo, this is a really good time to sort of prune it back. And pruning it back, there's lots of instructions on the web on how to do it, but basically grapevines, uh, fruit and leaf on the last year's growth. So you should always cut it back and leave just two buds from the last year's growth on the main stem if you want any grapes. But in addition to that, there, there's cutting out old wood in black currants and things like this and pruning out dead wood um, where you can. Obviously, the ones to avoid these days are nectarines because you need to do those when, when the leaf has sprouted, otherwise they're prone to, to viruses. So what else? Compost. Now, most gardeners could talk forever about compost. And if you've got compost, then it's a great time to fertilize around the garden. And, what you, what you put into the garden is often what you get back out. So I should be doing that, particularly on the black currants there, and just putting some general fertilizer around uh, the raspberries and other parts of the allotment. And then, yeah, I mean, the, the gardening year has started, we're all looking ahead to it. So I'm, I've got my seed potatoes. I don't know if any of you grow seed potatoes, but now's the time to really plant first and second earlies and shortly main crops. But, at the moment, I've got a whole bunch of potatoes in the potting shed in um, not egg boxes, actually, I don't have egg boxes anymore, but I've got them in seed trays and they're all chitting, which means most of us chit, chit out potatoes 
um, not realising when we look at in the vegetable box and think they've all gone green and they've got sprouts on them. Well, that's effectively what I'm doing <laughs> in the potting shed. So, yeah. And then, of course, in, in a couple of weeks time, when the soil has started to warm up, I'll be putting those out. And I'll also be putting out and, and sowing garnet cloves and onion sets. And really, that's kicking off the, the growing season. And after that, as the soil warms up, um, hopefully we'll be able to put out more hardy plants. Another thing, obviously, that is worth starting off indoors is tomato plants. They have a, as you know, I'm sure, they have a very long growing season. So, yeah, it's a good time to get them going on the windowsill um, or similar. If you have a heating propagator, that's just as good. So, yeah, that's sort of my sort of quick roundup of, of what's going on in, in my allotment at the moment in terms of fruit and veg. Um, so, over to somebody else. Don't know who. Over to Sue. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm desperately <laughs> thinking about cutting, cutting my time. What I'm doing in the garden is tidying up, tidying up the flower beds, uh, waging war on Spanish bluebells, which are total thugs and um, should never be sold. You should never buy Spanish bluebells. They're bad. Uh, so anyway, I try and dig up as many of those as I can. And I, I'm gently pruning summer flowering shrubs. That, that is things that flower after June, July. Do not prune your spring flowering shrubs or you won't get any flowers on them. It's too late. You leave them to flower now and then you prune them after they've finished flowering. For the first time ever, I bought some plug plants last month from a local garden center, which was crazy because it was a month early and they came in these teeny tiny little trays which are enough to give any decent self-respecting plant foot ache. It's like wearing a pair of shoes that is too tight. So I transplanted them into each little tray into a full-size seed tray. It's far too early. I just went mad. Don't buy your plug plants until the second half of March. Don't do as I have done. Do as I'm suggesting to you now. Anyway, these are petunias. They're very healthy. They're far too advanced. I shall have to try and keep them very cool in our unheated conservatory or they'll be flowering far too soon before they can go out. Anyway, we live and learn, but plug plants are good. Um, it's a, I don't, I don't, I try not to spend too much money on annual plants and that's a cheaper way of doing it. I thought, what shall I do with these stupid little trays? Shall I just throw them away? I had three of them. And then I got a free pack of echinacea seeds from with my Gardener's World magazine. So I thought, right, we need some echinacea in the garden because I'm trying to do my best to encourage bees and other pollinators into the garden because they are going down in numbers at a frightening rate. And if you're a gardener, you shouldn't have too neat and tidy a garden. You want to have things which will pollinate. So we've also put in a decent sized wild flower patch uh, last autumn and it's, everything's growing and we're hoping that the wild flowers will attract bees and other insects. Anyway my little tray, I thought, what should I do with this? So my favorite compost mix, which I use for everything, new potting compost mixed with vermiculite, which lightens it and makes the soil very easy for the little tiny roots to get down into. I use two of those trays. You can't see a thing here, but anyway, believe me. Um, two of these trays filled with my favorite potting compost mix as a, as a, um, a tray, I've used a lid from a plastic container from my kitchen. And if I peer through the plastic, I can see that two of my little echinacea plants have uh, sprouted. So when they've nearly all sprouted, I will release them from their plastic bag, which makes its own little microclimate, and introduce them to the wider, wider world of my kitchen without the plastic bag. And then when they're big enough to handle, I will pop them up into a full-size seed tray, the same size tray that I put the petunias in. And I hope that I'm going to get 30, I reckon, echinacea plants for pennies. Now, if you go to the garden center and buy an echinacea in a pot, it will cost you six or seven pounds. So this is a much better way of doing it. And I may even have some to give to friends. I do do cuttings. It's the wrong time of year to do cuttings. You need to wait till June, July, August even, when everything is bushy and growing and confident and the weather is warm. I've, I've done a mock up there. I don't think I've got time to talk about it, but I'll just do a little boast. This is a salvia. 
I've never done a cutting of a salvia till last September. It was too late. Most of them died, but this one flourished. And a salvia is a really useful doer. It's, um, it's a nice little shrub. It's got a lovely scent because it's sage family and it has red and white flowers. It's called salvia hot lips. It's a good name. Um, so now I've got a baby salvia for nothing, really. And another little boast, and I'll show you with this because this is useful. This, I was up at, we were up at, at our youngest son's house in Sidcup, and I'll confess my sins to you. I noticed an absolutely beautiful fuchsia climbing up. It was so tall, it was growing up his neighbor's wall. Obviously, they couldn't see it, but then it was growing over the wall and into David and Emma's garden. So I thought, well, the neighbors can't see it, and what they can't see won't hurt them. So I took three pieces off this fuchsia growing over my son's wall, put them in a plastic bag, brought them home and immediately potted them up in my usual potting compost and vermiculite mixture. And they all took, that was last September. I've got three of these. It's a fabulous fuchsia, but it's a bit leggy and I'm going to be very cruel to it. So you, you just have to brace yourself. And I'm going to pinch out, oof, that little bit like that poor thing. And I'm going to pinch that one out. And you can't see, but there are tiny little baby leaves growing in the leaf axles there. So that's, you keep them bushy. You don't want them leggy. And I'm going to have three beautiful fuchsia plants. One for me, one for David up in Sidcup, and one to give to a friend for pennies. That's me. Brilliant. Over <laughs> to you, Chris. <laughs> John's giving me a thumbs up. <laughs> right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ponds, although there's not, not a great deal to say this time of uh, year, but um, I created a pond last year in my garden because I wanted to encourage more wildlife into the garden. And I had one before and used to get uh, lovely dragonflies and damselflies and frogs and toads and things. So. Um, I made that last year and I did uh, in fact hear a, a frog or a toad croaking one Sunday afternoon last year so I'm hopeful um, that I'll get more this year but at this time of year because I've got quite a few mature trees around me not actually in the garden but up the hill as it were um, I get some leaves collecting in the pond like beech leaves and oak leaves and they can be a problem because um, uh, as the water temperature warms up, um, they start to decompose and that increases the nutrient levels in the pond. And uh, then it will uh, probably go a, a murky green, a bit like um, you get in the Pool Park Lake, I suppose. You get an algal bloom because of the increased nutrient level and the light levels, obviously, with the sun as well. So I've been fishing out the leaves as I see them and also uh, trimming back some of the plants where they might have died, died, or there's some dead bits on them again, because that would increase the nutrient levels. So that's what I've been doing with the pond at the moment. And um, yeah, so, uh, and then the other things I've been doing, um, like um, Glenn, I've been sowing um, some vegetable seeds. So I've sown spinach and uh, tomatoes and cucumbers so far. Uh, indoors on the windowsill and I, the spinach you're supposed to sow outside but I sometimes find it's easier to get it going inside and then put it out later um, and then uh, I've also been sowing uh, flower seeds like Sue um, so trying to save the pennies so I've sown cosmos and they've they've come back up already in about uh, well I sowed them last Sunday and they're up already so that's um, that's really encouraging and this uh, the spinach is also up as well so and then I sowed some eryngium as well and that can save you an awful lot of money on buying perennial plants um, I don't tend to do a lot of border plants probably cosmos is the only thing I do in terms of bedding plants mostly I try to garden with perennials um, as they sort of come up each year um, and the other thing I've been doing is thinking about feeding. So where I've got things in pots, if you, you know, they won't go on forever. The compost that you put them in lasts for about maybe six weeks or something like that. So where I've got bulbs in pots, um, I feed them now. So to try and encourage them to 
uh, flower again next year. And I've also got azalea and camellia in pots as well. And they're coming into growth now and starting to flower. So again, I'm feeding those. And if you've got azaleas and camellias, you need to um, feed them with a, a special feed uh, that's suitable for acid loving plants. Um, so I sometimes use um, a proprietary feed or um, a liquid seaweed feed for those. And um, yeah, like Glenn, I'm also thinking about the fruit that I've got in my garden, like the black currants and the raspberries um, and cherry tree, um, feeding that um, so that that will produce good fruit. You need to think about that now because you need to get the flowers first. So I'll use, um, you know, a more potassium uh, based for, uh, feed for that. And I tend to, you, you can use um, liquid tomato food, food, but I tend to use my own comfrey feed. So I grow comfrey in the garden, which sort of looks pretty-ish. Um, and uh, then you mash up the leaves in water and dilute it about one in 10. And that encourages, I use that as my tomato feed and for encouraging flowers in the garden um, as things come into flower and keeping them going. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I like to garden organically. So I tend to use uh, chicken, um, chicken manure pellets as a general fertilizer, my comfrey feed to encourage flowers and fruit, and then sometimes a liquid um, seaweed food uh, I find useful as well. So I think that's me. Thank you, Chris. Uh, who's next? Oh, Sue, come on, Sue. Yeah. Yeah, my main interest is wildlife in the garden, um, which does mean that um, you're encouraged to have a quite a messy garden. You don't want it too tidy, which is quite comforting. Um, yeah, so I like wildflowers and I've got some wildflowers in my garden. At the moment, I've got lovely primroses that seed themselves everywhere and they're in flower. I've got lesser celandine, which is a bit of a thug and it just goes everywhere but once it's flowered, it dies down. So I don't worry too much about that. And there are other plants, you can have other flowers. They don't have to be wild. They don't have to be native. There's a lot of plants that are good for um, bees and butterflies and other insects. And you can find lists on various websites and books and things. Um, I'm going to be sowing evening primrose um, in, in, in a, a, this month and I'm also going to sow musk mallow which is a lovely pink wildflower uh, very pretty with pretty sort of cut leaves so I shall be sowing those this month and seeing how they do. Um, I've also sown a meadow strip I did that in the autumn I, and uh, that is sprouting nicely it's a mixture of grass and wild meadow plants so I shall be looking at that and seeing how it goes and uh, hoping for some nice meadow mix there. Um, I also enjoy encouraging birds. When I first moved into this house I did the big garden bird watch on the first January and I got two species. I got a robin and a magpie I think. Um, this year I got 10 species and I do keep account of what I see and I've actually overall seen 24 different types of bird in the last year. And uh, so I find hanging, hanging my feeders in trees, they really like that. Um, and I provide water for them. They, they like to drink from the bird bath rather than, rather than bath in it. But that's been particularly useful in the cold frosty days. Um, I shall be raking my lawn. My lawn has got loads of moss in it and um, I think I'm going to leave little bits of moss in places so that they can use it for their nests if they want to. Um, I'll try that. Uh, my lawn actually is a real mess. It's got a lot of yellow, they're not dandelions, they're cat's ears, but they've got um, cat's ears in them and various other things. But I actually like different plants in the lawn especially when the lawn goes brown it means that they stay green if you've got clover and stuff in it it doesn't go brown and also it's uh, the bees love clover and insects or, uh, will like all the little plants that are growing in the lawn so um, don't be too fastidious about tidying up your lawn um, 
yeah, I think uh, I think that's probably about it, really. I've got a little pond. Going back to Chris's, I I have had a little, uh, just a plastic box on the patio, surrounded by rocks. Uh, put I put frog spawn in it uh, about five years ago, and uh, some of them grew into frogs, or probably one or two. Um, and every year since, I've actually had frog spawn appear in this little box, which is rather nice. So this year, I've actually dug a pond as well. Uh, in somewhere else in the garden, slightly bigger one. So I'm going to wait and see what appears in that. And I think that's all apart from veg. I haven't got a veg patch, but last year I grew uh, runner beans and tomatoes and mange too very successfully in pots. I uh, had them outside my back door. So every time I ran hot water, I used the cold water to water them. They were nice and nice and um, and near and I was very pleased with the results so I shall be doing that again this year so I shall be sowing my tomatoes this month I think that's it yeah thanks Sue Jan come in please hello hi um, I'm probably the novice in the group because for many many years I had a balcony it was only six years ago that uh, we went from the ridiculous to the sublime from a very small bar, um, balcony to a 120 foot garden. But the blessing of it was that uh, the person before had done all the work and had done the designing. And within the garden, there was a, a greenhouse. So I'm gonna speak about the value of the greenhouse to me. Um, I, I find the greenhouse is really my go-to place. Um, there's so much variety, but how I can use it, um, I can keep, stuff in there, you know, like fertilizer and tools, netting, um, sticks and trays and pots and all that kind of thing. In the first year, I did actually use the soil in there for planting. Um, um, I planted um, peppers and tomatoes. But I find now that I, I don't plant in there so much. I use it for uh, seed sowing and growing on cuttings and protection of plants. I find it really, really good for that. And um, it, and also it's very consistent conditions. So when you, you've got something that you want to be a bit careful about, you can start it off in the greenhouse. You say you're waiting, where should I put it in the garden? Uh, just look after it there. And then of course, gradually bring it out and get it used to a different a temperature and different surroundings. And um, I, I find that it's it's very good for all seasons. Um, you, you, even when the season is, is kind of coming to an end, you can get away with maybe doing some cuttings or carrying on um, sewing stuff, even a bit beyond when you might normally do so. Um, as was mentioned by Sue, I think, you can save a lot of money with sowing seeds, and I really find that you, you can get. Um, I've got a little stand where I have trays, and I can put um, all the little uh, plug um, containers. You can use all sorts of containers to sow your seeds, and then you can cover them up, and it's just lovely to have them all in one place. And um, yeah, another thing I find um, a blessing about the greenhouse is that on days when you think, oh, it's too cold to go and do anything in the garden, it's actually warmer in the greenhouse. You can shut the door and um, you know, have your hat and coat on or whatever, and you can still do useful jobs and still feel like you're outside. And um, it's a great place for your coffee, having a coffee break on a windy day as well. I'll just uh, finish by mentioning that um, Dick has a great aunt, Lil, and she used to use her greenhouse for sowing nasturtiums. So this is what she did. She surrounded herself in the greenhouse with nasturtiums and she would plonk herself down in the deck chair in the middle, <laughs> even when it was not the summertime. <laughs> so she, that was how she, she got a real joy from her greenhouse like that. Okay, so that's my little bit about greenhouse. And last but not least, Steve. You're muted, Steve. You're muted.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, <clears throat> I like this time of year because it gives you an opportunity to uh, cut back large shrubs. Quite often we've got large evergreen shrubs in the garden and <clears throat> it can be uh, uncertain when to cut them back, but now is a good time. Things like um, um, Fetinia or Bay Laurel, things that are, that are big like that, uh, they can be cut out now. And I find that this is a good time to do that because the cut wounds are not, are not there for a long time uh, subject to, the, to cold weather and frost, but you know, within a month or so, there's going to be new growth and they're going to cover the, the wounds. And uh, so um, that's better from the, from the tree, the, from the shrubs point of view. And also it's, it's best uh, to look at a, a nice fresh green or in the case of Fetinia, red uh, leaves rather than looking at the wounds. So, so now's a good time to do that. And uh, that also goes for um, other shrubs like roses. Now's a good time to cut roses back ready for their, that, that uh, thrust of new growth that's gonna come within the next month or so. I do that with Lavatera as well, because they can get their, their short-lived short -lived bushes, but they can be cut hard back. And uh, now's a good time because they're gonna flush again very shortly. And of course, Budlia, you can do that too as well, because that's pretty tough. Uh, I mean, it'll recover whenever you hit it, but, but now's a good time to do that. Uh, and the same goes for trees. You can be, you can use this next month or so to prune back low branches or to cut back from structures. But you've got to be careful about the species because you've probably all heard about bleed trees and uh, maples and birch fall into that category. And if you cut those sort of trees now, then they're going to um, drip sap from now until when the, the leaves come out. So you have to avoid cutting those sort of trees. And bleed trees also include hornbeam uh, and walnuts, you mustn't do walnuts, or poplars or leguminous trees. And if you're not quite sure what, if you've got a leguminous tree, then think back to when there were fruits on it. And if they were the long hanging pods, then that means it's a legume. But uh, if you avoid all of those, pruning those just now, then you can do those later in the year. And also, as Glenn alluded to, uh, with some of the fruit trees, there, there's, there can be problems with diseases, particularly silverleaf disease. So you have to be careful, don't prune cherries or apples or plums, uh, or even if you've got species rhododendrons, don't do them just yet either. Wait until the midsummer so that the, um, the immune system of the tree is active and that provides the protection for the tree from these diseases. So that, that's my advice as to what to do in the garden just yet. Brilliant. That was a very good overview. Thank you all very much. Um, I've, I've made some notes myself as I've been going through. Um, we have had some questions that have come in during the week. So probably I think best to advance those first for the next few minutes and then we'll try and get some in at the end of yourselves that are watching to be fair to you because I'm just aware time's slipping by quickly. So the first question we had was, um, please could you give me some suggestions for bringing colour to a shady border with all year round interest? So um, Glenn, you had some thoughts of asking questions about that. And then I think, Sue, you had the remedy for it, On the, um, if I'm right in saying so. She's shaking her head. Glenn, do you just want to ask, just to qualify what we, the person was asking about the shady spot as to what that might have been? Yeah, I mean, the que question is, and, it, and it's, a, it's a really hard problem in the, in, in the garden with, with shady spots. And I've, I've got one at the end of the garden where we've got a great big oak tree and it sucks the life out of the soil and stops the rain coming down. So what to grow there is a big problem. But there's also shady plant, shady areas which are the wrong side of the fence, as it were, in terms of the sun. So you need to really um, focus on which it is really if it's damp and shady then it's not so much of a problem to be fair you can probably grow most things there 
Um, but if it's dry and shady, and usually it's down to a, a tree sucking the life out, um, that's a much more difficult area. And, you know, you need to, you need then to realize that it's going to be quite hard work to get a lot of things to, to survive in that area, but it is doable. It is doable with persistence and, and a little bit of preparation. So that would be my first question to, to, for you to decide whether it's dry or whether it's, it's a damp, shady area. Damp, shady areas, as I say, there's a fair number of plants and there's not too much worry there. But if you're looking at um, dry, shady areas, then, um, yeah, you need to select your plants, which you see perhaps in nature growing in, in shade. Things like rhododendrons and, and camellias and things like that, they grow well in the shade but they need, need a bit of um, loving TLC, as it were, uh, keep them watered for the first few years till they get the roots down deep. I've got, as I say, I've got a shady area and I've, I've tried um, some rhododendrons and camellias down there and several of the rhododendrons have given up, but the camellias taken off and it's doing well, to be fair. Um, and the other, the other point that, I think to raise is obviously um, to decide if, if it's an, a, a more, um, should we say, if, if it's a border which perhaps is, is not in that situation, but it's a wide border, then you need to think about the depth of the plants that you put down there. So, you know, these days, more and more um, of the garden you see on question time and the like, they, they go for deep beds so that you have a, a structured layer of plants which gives depth as well as um, the colour to a border. So very often you start off with the taller um, taller green plants at the back which give you uh, a green all the year round and then you work forward um, to the lower and smaller plants. So yeah, so that, those, those are the things you need to think about and also the style you want. In some cases you can perhaps go for a, a more tropical border with the sort of spiky ferns and, and um, things like fatsia and, and palms and things like that. Others you can go for more herbaceous borders. So the, those are the considerations. But there are quite a number of plants within each area that will grow in a shady, shady spot. So, I mean, I, I've suggested camellias, um, schwarzia, which you see now is quite common, you know, the Mexican mox orange it is a great plant really, but it does it does grow quite big, but you can propagate it, so you can't you? <laughs> it does propagate very easily. But that's a nice plant because, a nice bush, because it's evergreen. Uh, it flowers in the spring, and then you prune it as if it was a hedge, and it will flower generally in the autumn as well. So it's, it's quite a nice plant from that point of view, and it fills a gap, but it does spread. It's, it's probably about four foot high and with a six foot spread probably. So there are plants like that. Um, Generally darker leaved plants, uh, Ceanothus, you know, um, California lilac is, is a good plant and so on. And then for the foreground, um, Japanese anemones, yeah, they're great, they, they survive. Cranesbill or the common geranium is quite good and even hostas do well. So there, there's a series of plants, but you will need to water them for the first few years and make sure that they um, survive. Thank I think you. that's probably the best I can offer. Thanks, Sue. Uh, thanks, Glenn, rather. Sue, got anything to add to that? Because I know you've got a border of length, haven't you, in, in uh, shade? Glenn has mentioned, I think, most of the, of the plants. It is a challenge. We, we, like many of you, are great compost heap makers. And we've just kept the, feeding the soil every year, really, with as much compost as we can, because it's dry and the plants only get sunshine for a few hours in the morning. Um, so yeah, I just keep feeding the soil really. If you've got good soil, it retains the moisture. Um, and uh, I think that's, that helps a lot. Yes, you need tough plants really for a shady border, but, but look after the soil. Excellent. Thank you very much. John, I think we've got a picture of a, a random um, honeysuckle that's on, on the, on the, on the, we're going to show you a picture now of a honeysuckle. Steve, um, perhaps you could come in and, and give comment on what you thought on this honeysuckle and what's to be done with it. 
Uh, thanks, Gordon. Looking at this photograph, it looks to me as though this is a honeysuckle that has not been controlled. So really the honeysuckle is in, it's doing its stuff regardless of what your the owner is wanting out of that plant. So the pruning for that is not minor fiddling about to try and get it to flower in the short term. What you've got to do is get control of the situation. And that means hard pruning the, the honeysuckle in order to begin to train it where you want it to grow. Now, if you're hard pruning something like this, you do need to recognize you're probably sacrificing a, a season's worth of flowers, but it's worth it because you get back control over the situation and you are then going to be able to, to, <clears throat> to train the honeysuckle up so that it can be a greater value to you in the future. And as Glenn mentioned when we were talking about this before, <clears throat> it's, it's possible to, to run uh, wires along the fence line so that you can extend that trellis, which looks pretty small. So if you put wires across the fence line, then you're going to give a bigger area for the honeysuckle to grow into. And once you've pruned it back and you prune it back to the main stem and the main um, side branches, and then as the new growth appears, then you start to train that along the, the extent of the trellis and then outwards along those, those wires. And after, because honeysuckle flowers on second year wood, you need to wait and allow that second year wood to ripen. But when you do that, you, you find that you've got, you've got the flowers in the, in the place you want. And in a situation like this, you've got a more um, two dimensional plant that is gonna be great for covering that, that fence. And then once you've got that structure in place, all you've got to do is just on an annual basis, prune back to that structure to keep it in a two dimensional um, uh, shape. So it's, a, it's, it's gonna take two or three years to, to get control of a situation like that. But once you have, you'll find that uh, the, the honeysuckle is gonna be able to do its stuff and give you a lot of uh, enjoyment. Good. That was a very uh, concise answer on, on the taming of the honeysuckle. Um, we've got another question. Um, maybe, Sue, you want to have a, have a go at this one? Sue Clark, I'm looking at. Maybe um, anybody else wants to chip in with their paddles later on. Um, the question is, the best plants to help, um, to help bees? Bees and plants, which are the best, best ones that they love, the pollinators? Mm. Sue, over to you. Yeah, um, well, I, I like, in my garden, I like foxgloves. I love to watch the bees going into, into the foxgloves. Um, lavender is good. Honeysuckle is good. Um, there's something called phacelia, which um, is grown as a green manure plant, which a bit like comfrey, which is also um, very good for bees. And I've seen that on the cliff tops actually, um, around, um, Camphor Fifth's way, the council I think have grown it, um, but you can grow that from seed. Um, perennial wallflower, Arizimum bowls mauve, that's that's good, and um, I've grown that from cuttings actually, so that's one you can propagate yourself. Marjoram, I've got a lot of marjoram in my garden, and the bees love that, so there are all sorts of things. I think. Obviously, native flowers are probably better, although some non-native ones can be good, but not double ones. You, the bees need to be able to get their little tongues into the, the nectar of the flowers, so you don't want anything double. Things like panagoniums aren't any good, and I'm afraid I don't think petunias are either. Um, so, yeah, there's different bees, like different plants. They have different lengths of tongues and able to, so there's quite a lot of uh, biology of bees that you can go into. But that's, that's some suggestions anyway. I probably and they, the plot yeah. Yeah. And, and they, do, they do love purple. Apparently, um, yeah. I don't know what you're, whether you're colorblind or not, but bees are drawn to the color purple. So anything that you've got purple in your garden, lavateria, et cetera. 
Yeah. Um, as Sue said, foxgloves, they are drawn immediately too. And it's also good, I think, to consider that um, in the summertime, there's plenty of plants that can do that for the bees, but it's good also to look at plants that, that flower on into the autumn when um, the, the larder gets a bit thinner for the bee um, so that they've still got um, access to growing plants. Um, yeah, can I just add a little bit more? Yeah, um, another good plant, I think, and in the autumn, is, is ivy and, and I was thinking with the shady border as well at the back so I think people have various sort of uh, relationships with ivy and some people think it's very invasive but there are different sorts of ivy and some aren't that invasive and some are variegated and very pretty to look at and I, I like ivy growing up the back of a on a fence or a wall and, um, and in the autumn that has flowers which are very good for nectar Good stuff. Um, we've had another question as well. There's been mention of compost this morning. Um, and they, the questioner asks, my compost are dry and not rotting down. What's the best way to produce good material to spread on the garden? Um, I'll have a shot at this and then open it up to the panel. But um, essentially, I think you've got to start off considering what sort of base you've got your compost on um, so that it does drain. If your compost is dry, the answer is to damp it or wet it. In other words, put the hose on it to, to wet it down. My particular compost bin I have is not one of the plastic types, but I actually physically just made it out of some old pallet wood and I put a lid on it so that I can control the amount of water that goes on it so it doesn't become what I call a rotting, smelly mess. But I actually got some control over it. Um, but in order to just bring... Um, moisture to it um, this isn't to sound posh but if we've got if we've had cut flowers when we come to throw them away they've still got res residue of water in they will take moisture to it as will all your cuttings and peelings from your vegetables um, always helps to have a little bit of in the bottom of the bowl just to add some sprinklings of water and then I I layer I try to I don't do it like a Victoria sponge but I try to layer my compost bin so periodically um, I don't know what you do with your Amazon packaging if you get it, but I strip all the tape off it because unfortunately that won't rot down. And then I just break it up into small pieces about the size of an envelope and put it into the compost bin. So that, and that gives you your nitrogen, which gets the compost moving. Um, so with those layers plus vegetable cuttings and um, what else is going and, and of course lawn cuttings you can start to put in as well. But don't put your lawn cuttings in if you've just fed your lawn because um, that is not desirable. But thereafter, put your lawn cutting in, in because generally they are already well shredded and hopefully you'll get a good activated compost um, which will come through. And periodically, of course, if you've got the mechanism to do it, I've got some um, uh, tearing down the side. I just take my planking out, sorry and then I shovel it around and give it a good old mix and um, it, 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 um, it's good after a few months. Anybody else want to comment in the panel on that? Anybody got any other thoughts? No, okay, well, we'll move on then. Um, last one, um, how to look after lavender. Oh, so no, how to look after lavender. Um, Chris, do you want to have a go at that or? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, the main thing with lavender is um, to keep it sort of trimmed down. So after it's flowered, when the flowers are sort of dying off, then, you know, trim it back. Because if you let it, um, if you don't do that, it gets out of control and starts to become very woody. And uh, then it's quite difficult to get get back in control. So just give it a haircut um, after it's flowered and then you might get some more flowers and give it another haircut. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. Good. The, if I could just add one thing to the compost, that, the other Thank thing you. I find useful to add to the compost is some um, shredded paper. So if you've got a paper shredder and you shred up, you know, things you don't want to put in the bin, then that's a very good thing to add as well, because it adds the carbon um, side of the compost as well as the nitrogen from the green things. Excellent. OK, so, oh, um, there was a other brief question about what to grow in pots in a shady spot. Um, Sue, you were talking about, Sue Hosey I'm looking at now, um, you're talking about 
I think the word was blousy the other night. And I can't remember what you had that wonderful flower that. Um, I was being rude, being rude about begonias because they're, <laughs> you know, plants have fashions like anything else does. And some plants are in and some plants are out, which is ridiculous. I don't think begonias are in, but if you want something really bright, even garish, just to cheer up a dull, shady corner, buy some begonia corms, I suppose about now. Get them started off in small, small pots in your greenhouse if you've got one, in your conservatory or on your kitchen windowsill. And when all danger of frost is past, stick them out in larger pots in the garden and deadhead them like crazy. Um, they really do need to be constantly deadheaded and they will flower for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, very cheery, if not fashionable. Thank you. So <laughs> that concludes, I think, the questions that were online. So here's the opportunity. If you've got a comment or a question you'd like to ask, I think, John, we've got a few more minutes, 10 minutes, would I say, maybe? Uh, yeah, Gordon, I think your, your sister Jill would like to say something as well. She's got Would a hand up. Oh, she's got a hand up. So I don't take any notice of my sister. <laughs> Carry on, girls. <laughs> oh, this has been great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a supplemental about the lavender, actually, because that was really useful. We've got loads of lavender in our front garden, which actually we've just been trimming this week. Um, but a couple of plants are really quite old now. They're about 15 years old and they're really, really woody. Um, even though we have sort of done it every year and sort of kept them going. Um, if they get that to that point, is it the point where you just say that's enough? It's never going to be. It's never going to get any better, and just dig it up and replace it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I personally would say yes, Jill. Um, if because they just get leggy and woody, and you mm. don't get a lot mm. of vibrancy out of them, so it's hard because you've got clear ground and nothing there for a moment. But I, I would mm. go for. Uh, extrication then start again I think and, and when when would you plant them sort of wait till it gets a bit warmer yes um, so I think the local nursery is open to me but um, I'm not sure any other comments from the panel no I, I think that yeah there's there's so much you can do I we had some in, in, in our last place in the front garden and they got very very woody in the end and yeah there was really no alternative. I, I did try to brutally prune them back, but they just yeah, you know, they just get the, the wood gets longer and longer. Then you, yeah. you I was put, spent an hour the other day just pulling out dead stuff, and then they just look awful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks. Jan, you, Jan, you were just, Jan, you were just showing you waving your flower. Did you want to yeah. add a comment on it? I, I was just going to add that I read somewhere recently that they are they are short lived. They won't yeah. last forever. So I'm I'm actually going to buy some about a half dozen plants soon and yank mine out and put those in, put new ones in. Okay, okay, Jill. Yep. Any other questions from anybody on that's watching in? Thank you very much for sticking with us this morning. I hope you found it beneficial. Kate, you had your hand up first. You're muted, Kate. You'll need to unmute. I struggle with growing parsley and I love herbs and it always starts off and then just dies back. And I cannot, within a few weeks, it doesn't sort of, I know they're not ongoing, but I just can't grow it. Any hints? Hey, what was that? Parsley, did you say? Parsley, yes. Right. Yes, I mean, I, I grow it on the allotment and... Um... I hate to say it, but I don't usually have too much problem with it. You, oh. could, you, could, try, you could try growing it in a pot. And... I do, I do. I've had, I tried both. Okay, yeah, I don't know what to suggest then. It likes reasonably good sun, sunny spot, obviously, mm. not too, too hot. But um, yeah, I don't know. I should keep persevering. I'm sure you'll get success soon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sue, what did you want to say? Sue, you were waving. Um, I cheat. I buy um, a pot of parsley from Sainsbury's, which is all really packed in. Um, and I actually plant, I plant it in a, in a trough in a shady place. I suppose you could put it in the garden. It needs moist shade and it just keeps going, um, which is much easier. I think it is quite difficult to start from seed. 
Um, but uh, that's the way I do it. And then when it dies, I buy another pot and I plant that and um, keep it watered. Yeah. Dan, you, you were waving your flower at me about, were you? Yeah. Dan? Yeah. Yeah, go on. yeah, I've had that problem as well with parsley. And I think maybe I haven't had it in a shade. Um, but actually last year I moved over and planted flat leaf parsley and that's done really well and it's even come through the winter and so I can see it's going to come on in the same place this year as well. Mm -hmm. But I like uh, Sue's idea of the Sainsbury's mm -hmm. come, come again, that's a really good one. Why, why struggle, why strive? <laughs> <laughs> I have heard it said, I think, that if a woman can grow parsley, she's the one that wears the trousers in the house. So um, <laughs> maybe you know your place. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to comment on that. <laughs> Jack, 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 <laughs> Jackie, you put your hand up for a question, please. You're muted. You're muted. We've got a patch that's about three foot deep and six foot wide. No, do I mean that? Six foot in length and three foot deep um, against a fence because we had an old fence taken out and some shrubs taken out and so on. And I thought we could grow some fruit, um, some soft fruit, like, and it's years since I've grown raspberries. And I'm not sure, A, whether this is the right time to put something in and B, whether to go for raspberries, boys and greys, blackberries, don't want to do black currants, but one of those sort of soft fruits. And I, so I'd like something that's sort of fast growing so that we can reap the benefits fairly quickly. What would the panel advise? Please. <laughs> well, Steve, any thoughts? Oh, Glenn. I, I think if you want a quick return, then you can get cultivated uh, blackberries. Right. Uh, and they, I mean, they are so prolific. I, I get get kilos and kilos of fruit, but they will they will fruit probably this year if they're a reasonably mature plant, and they certainly next year. But they'll put out obviously uh, growth this year, which will be next year's fruit effectively. And you could train that along the fence, um, but that certainly gives you a quick payback in mm -hmm. terms of fruit. Okay. Thank you. It's the cultivated varieties without the thorns, thornless varieties. Stevie, any ideas? Any thoughts, rather? No, I, I haven't got anything to add. I think Glenn's answer was good. Yeah. Okay, all right. Anybody else got anything to add on the panel? No. Janet, you've got your hand up. Go for it. And unmute, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hi, Glenn. It's been great listening to all your ideas and that. Um, I, last, last autumn I put my daffodil bulbs, I put them in pots and they've come up really lovely and I'm really happy with them. I put them in pots because I'm so fed up with when they finish they just look so un, untidy and what I plan to do is move them into a place down the garden where where they're not sort of on view so much when they finish but what I want to know is should I take them out of the pots for, for next year or should I sort of keep them in the pots and just feed them or something ready for next year? Sue, you are nodding your head. Me? Yeah. Mm. I think they'll get a bit starved, Jan, if they're stuck in those pots year right. after year. Yeah. Um, so, so you should so try feeding them and see how it goes. But I think I would probably put them in, I just put up with the untidiness of, of spring bulbs. I think the glory of them is so cheering when the weather's still cold that I just let them stay untidy and break yeah. up the leaves as they die back and think, well, they've given me weeks of pleasure. I have a little untidiness now. So you, you don't tie them back then when they finish? Oh, no, 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 don't that's cut them. What I, that's what I don't like doing because they just look, yeah, I don't think it helps them. So, no, um, take, deadhead them when they finish flowering. Take off, cut them down below the seed where the seed pod is forming. Oh, so that oh. makes them look. That makes them immediately look tidier, and yeah. then just lift them and stick them somewhere that you want them for next year, and endure the untidy leaves for a few weeks. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think... I'm not a tidy gardener, so it's not that so much. It's just um, knowing the best thing to do. With they them, are a mess. Whether to keep them in the ones. These, these actual ones to keep them in the pots, or I think it's yeah. from what you're saying, it's best to move them, is to yeah. pull them up when it's the right time, and then um, put them in another spot for the next year. I think, yes, yeah. where they, yeah, where they can spread their feet a bit. Mm. Yeah, mm. lovely. Thank you, Sue. Anybody else got any questions? Phil, good morning. Hello. Um, Steve was saying that it was a good time to uh, cut back various shrubs and things. Will he be, be a good thing to cut back at this time of year? Was that he be? Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure, but um, no, what I know of Hebe, I would think that uh, it would be okay, but it, it Hebe doesn't have particularly strong wood, so I, so it's it's got a tendency to uh, to rot back a little bit. Right. So although, so I'm, I'm trying to use basic principles because I don't know exactly the answer, but I would be. I'd be careful with Hebe and I wouldn't, I would, I would want to hang on until the summer to, yeah. explain, because I think you could possibly do too much harm just now. But having said that, if you've got a really big Hebe that is in the way, then that becomes your priority really. And you yeah. cut it back and then see how it goes. So yeah. Yeah. as we said right at the beginning, um, you know, everybody is experimenting and learning on the job with this. So you try things out, see how they work, and then uh, adjust accordingly. That's right. Something. Yeah. Our our physical priorities and, and needs override the biological ones, and we just figure it out as we go. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I think. Um... We've turned the hour, haven't we, John? So it's probably, is it time to say goodbye, John? Um, yeah, unless there's one last burning question, uh, we could probably fit that in if we've got one more. Otherwise, we we'll... questions. A very quick question to Sue Hosier. You mentioned several times, am I? Yeah, you mentioned several times what you put in with your potting compost, and I couldn't get whether it was immaculite or vermiculite or whatever light it was. <laughs> Yes, it's called vermiculite, V-E-R-M-I-C-U-L-I-T-E, vermiculite. It's a bit expensive, but a bag lasts me, oh, a couple of years, I would think. It's almost weightless, and um, it just does the job. It's sterile. It's not going to put any nasty bugs in your little pots. Um, you can use gravel. I know Monty Don absolutely loves gravel or grit or whatever, but I find that the bags are heavy to carry. So for me, it's a bag of vermiculite added to my potting compost. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you.